Welcome to the PR Works podcast, Business Way Outside the Box. I am your host, Steve Dubin, founder of PR Works. We are a full service public relations firm based in America's hometown, Plymouth, Massachusetts. We focus on unusual businesses or businesses that conduct themselves in unusual ways. If you can think of a company that fits the bill to be a guest, uh, visit our website, prworkzone.com, and uh, let us know, and we will consider that person for the future. Uh, and without further ado, I'd like to bring on my guest, Mike McKenna, who is the CEO of Adaptable. And um, Mike, you guys focus on website and digital accessibility, but please give us a little bit about your background first. Sure. Hey, Steve. Uh, thanks for having me on today. Um, so my name is Mike McKenna. I'm uh, the president and CEO of Adaptable and also of Shotgun Flat. Um, we are a web design and development company based in Middleborough, Mass, just down the road from America's hometown, about 15, 20 minutes away. Um, I've been involved in uh, website design, planning, consulting, development since uh, the late 90s. And I founded uh, Shock and Flat in 2002. And um, in, let's see, I guess it's 2018 now, or early 2019, uh, we founded Adaptable. Uh, Adaptable is um, a company that's focused on helping businesses and organizations ensure that their websites, their apps, and other digital entities are meeting um, accessibility requirements. Okay. And, and your personal background, um, give us a little bit of that, please. Sure. I grew up here in Middleborough, Massachusetts. I married my high school sweetheart. Uh, we have two kids that are in uh, Middleborough High School. Actually, my son uh, technically is scheduled to graduate tomorrow from Middleborough High. Um, I'm very involved in the community here. I, I'm involved in youth soccer. I'm involved in the downtown business um, development group here. Um, I play music in local bars and, and local uh, clubs. And uh, I've basically, I walk to work every day. So I'm, I'm, if you're ever in downtown Middleborough, I'm that guy that's walking around three or four times a day as I go home to let the dog out and check the mail and all that. So I'm uh, a townie. Uh, it's true a definition of a townie as you can get. And I've built my businesses here. Um, I employ people who grew up here, people who work here. So uh, yeah, I'm a proud, a proud uh, sachem. Okay, and and uh, and really, your your footprint of your business goes well beyond Middleborough. Obviously, uh, my understanding yeah. is that a lot of your clients are New York City ad agencies who are looking for a really good partner at a reasonable price with real added value. That's right. Yeah, for sure. So we have. Um, we're, we tend to work as a subcontractor quite a bit for uh, marketing and ad agencies in New York uh, and in Boston and, and around the U.S. Most of our business is focused in the Northeast, um, but we do have clients all over the country and we even have a few international clients as well. Um, I think one of the things about being in a small town um, is we have such, such low overhead compared to agency rates that you'd see in the city um, that uh, we can just provide more bang for the buck for our partners. Okay. And so um, give me your sort of log cabin story of what led you to hmm. um, expanding your business to uh, digital accessibility. Yeah, sure. It's not as quaint as a real log cabin story might be, but uh, basically what happened was we were hired by a chain of um, gas station slash convenience stores out of uh, the Midwest um, in Ohio to redesign their website. Um, this is probably four years ago now. And uh, basically one of the stipulations of our contract with, with them was to satisfy uh, the requirement, requirements of, uh, of a settlement that they had reached with a customer of theirs. So basically what happened was this chain of stores that had, I think, maybe three dozen locations around, mostly in Ohio, a couple in, um, in, in uh, Kentucky. They, they were sued by a customer 
for having a website that was not accessible. Uh, in this case, the customer was blind and they couldn't um, access the website in order to get special deals, special offers. He couldn't download the loyalty club app to the, his uh, phone. And so they basically um, were brought to court because their website didn't meet requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, now we had known about accessibility and had known how important it was before then, but that was the first time that we had um, a contract with a client that a, a big piece of um, the puzzle was to make sure that the site satisfied the ADA requirements. Um, and so that sort of just turned on the life for us. It said, well, now that this has been uh, sort of dealt with by the courts, um, this is going to become precedent and we're going to see a lot more of this. So we tried to uh, make sure that we got ahead of the curve on that stuff and, um, you know, start to get ourselves set up to help our existing clients um, with their accessibility as well as um, future customers. Okay, great. And, and so um, one of the things I was just reading was that during COVID-19, there's even more lawsuits coming up about website accessibility mm -hmm. because uh, people are more immobile than ever and using websites more than ever. Yep. Uh, are you yep. seeing a bump in your business or um, is it impacting you in any way? We're definitely seeing an increase in um, interest in the service. Uh, I think you're right. I think as people are home more and they're working from home, they're staying home, vacations are canceled, all that stuff. Um, it's just driving more and more people to the web to try to conduct daily business and daily life online. And as such, uh, I think that people who, who do have disabilities, uh, again, say someone with a visual impairment, um, they may be driven to the technology more than they would have been in the past. Um, and as such, uh, we've definitely seen an uptick in, uh, like you said, lawsuits, and complaints, but also in uh, business for us in terms of, of making sure that, um, that, that people have their technology up, up to snuff, for sure. Okay, and so um, in terms of litigation, I think a lot of people are motivated more by darkness than light. Yeah. Uh, what, what kind of litigation has occurred? What are the sort of the numbers being thrown around and the fines being assessed? In terms of uh, dollars and cents. Um, yes. Yeah. So as I understand it, having spoken with uh, an attorney in, in Boston who specializes in ADA law, um, basically what happens with these cases, again, as I understand, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, of course, but um, let's say, uh, Steve, for example, you have uh, a restaurant down in downtown Plymouth and you have some uh, ADA violations for accessibility, maybe you don't have the appropriate um, rails in the restrooms or there's not a ramp to access the restaurant with a wheelchair, those kinds of things. Um, typically what happens with an ADA complaint is that people will um, they'll file a complaint. It's a federal law, so it's all federal um, right from the get-go in most cases. California, they do it a little differently, of course, but uh, basically what would happen is I, I, would, I would come with a complaint and maybe there are eight things on the list that you had to resolve in order to be in compliance with the ADA. Um, if you go ahead and resolve all those eight things within an agreed upon time, could be 90 days, could be a year, it would depend on the, on the nature of the, the problems, um, then you're all set. There's no, there's no fines, there's no jail time or anything like that. You've basically been uh, flagged as someone in violation. You've accepted that and you've resolved it and then and life goes on. If you don't resolve all of them and, and you do seven out of the eight, um, then you're still gonna be, you're gonna be found to be in violation of the ADA. And then you're going to then be looking at potentially dealing with fines and so on, but also you will be responsible for 100% of the plaintiff's legal fees that they had to pay in order to um, you know, begin the process of um, the, the complaint and then the follow through and all that. So it really comes down to uh, the same thing online. It's the same application of the law. So if I have um, 25 issues on my website and I fix 24 of them 
and I don't get the 25th one done, um, I'm responsible to pay the legal fees of, of the person who had the issue to begin with, plus the cost of still fixing everything and then potentially fines on top of that. And, and so what are the, some of the numbers that you see coming through on those lawsuits? Um, I've seen more settlements than, than anything as opposed to, as opposed to here um, as basically decisions from judges. So usually stuff gets settled. Uh, we're seeing, I've seen numbers in the five figures, usually 10 to 15 K um, as a typical settlement plus the cost of still fixing the website issues too. So it can very easily get up, up and around or over 20,000. Okay. So, uh, the question is, I guess, um, what, what are some of the issues and why is, why is accessibility important? Yeah. Um, so it's important. I'll start with the, I'll answer the second question for us. Accessibility is important, um, because in, in America, um, under the ADA, under that, that act, um, we need to provide all people with the same access to the same services, um, regardless of disability or other, other hardship and physical hardship like that. So um, someone who's blind um, needs to be able to check their online banking balance just as easily as you or I do. So we have to make a reasonable accommodation to help them with that. So it's important in two ways. One, it's, it's well, three ways. It's the law, first of all. Um, it's the right thing to do, of course. And then, and finally, um, by not doing that, um, by not paying attention to and, and, and really investing in accessibility, um, you're leaving 20 per, up to 20% of the American population off of your potential customers list too. Um, so if you have someone who, who um, could be a potential client or a potential employee of yours um, and you don't have accessibility uh, figured out on your website, you, you could be losing business as well. Um, now going back to the first question, which was um, what are some of the problems that we see? Um, some of the biggest ones, uh, there's sort of three major areas. One is um, accessibility to information on a website for someone who's blind or has a visual impairment of some kind. And this could be anything from uh, a user who's, who's completely blind that uses a screen reader to physically read the contents of the website back to them so they can use their keyboard to tab along um, and the web page will read out loud to them. So this could be useful for someone, say, who was um, trying to find information on COVID on the Massachusetts government website and they wanted to read um, or hear the latest, uh, the latest studies or latest guidelines, say, for opening a church or something like that. Um, that information can be read to them so that they can hear it. Um, if you don't code the site in a way that it's compatible with these types of technologies, then those folks are left um, in, a, in a position where they can't, uh, they can't access that same information that you or I could. So that's a pretty common one um, is the, the, the visual impairments. Um, another one that's uh, become more relevant lately in the last couple of years with the uh, sort of onset of the use of a lot more video online is um, people who are hard of hearing or deaf who can't hear that great new video that you just posted on your website. So if your website's going to have an introductory video and it's going to have, you know, Steve Dubin on there gesturing and, and talking about PR works um, and there's no captioning on that video, they don't know what you're talking about. You're just waving your arms around and not very useful to that user. So um, having captioning on there is another thing that's, that's pretty common. Uh, a pretty common shortcoming. It's an easy one to fix, especially if you're using uh, YouTube. A lot of times you can auto caption and get things done. Um, auto caption doesn't work quite as well for guys like me that have a Boston accent and tend to mumble as well. So you have to be careful about your audio, but um, that one's one. And then the third one is, um, is dexterity. So you could be say uh, an older person or someone who has severe arthritis that just can't, um, operate a mouse or a trackpad like you or I could. Um, it could be someone who's had an injury or someone who's injured in even say in, in overseas as a soldier. Um, and they need to use 
a different approach to navigate the site as opposed to using a mouse. Um, so those are kind of the big three. And then it all comes down to how is the content on the website um, organized and how is it coded so that it can, uh, it can work with these special technologies that are available. Okay. And, um, and, and how many, what percentage of businesses would you approximate are really in violation? Um, you know, how big is your, your universe of prospects for this? Yeah. Um, it's close to a hundred percent have some type of issue. Um, there's kind of a spectrum there of, of severity. Uh, so one of the biggest challenges right now is that we've been talking about the federal government and the requirements of the ADA and, and technology. Uh, the ADA was written before the World Wide Web existed. It was certainly written before smartphones and apps existed. So one of the challenges that the government has had is to figure out how do we apply this law, which in the spirit of it makes all the sense in the world to, to use for uh, technology as well as physical businesses. But in the letter of it, it doesn't address it at all. Um, further complicating the issue is the government has issued no, um, no actual standard or guideline that says, okay, if you check off all these boxes now, you're compliant according to the federal courts. So we're using um, something called the WCAG, which is a, a set of, um, a set of uh, best practices and standards for coding um, the web that uh, if you follow those, then um, you're able to satisfy, um, from what we've seen so far, the court cases, that's what the, the, the judges are saying. Okay, we don't have a federal set of guidelines, so follow this international guideline instead. And I actually apologize. I kind of went on a tangent there, and I actually forgot the original question that you asked me about. Oh, that. That's all right. I think you actually covered it, whether you, <laughs> whether you know it or not. No worries. Uh, and so uh, given the fact that um, almost all websites have some lack of compliance. Mm. Oh, that's um, right. That was the question. And so I'm sure that there are anywhere from a short to a long list, depending on right. the website. Typically, how long does it take you to address those problems? Yeah, right. So the original question was what percentage of people um, have a problem? And the spectrum there, uh, everybody's, every, almost everyone can improve in some way. Um, most businesses that we audit, um, when we audit their website, we find that uh, they there's this trend where 85 to 90% of all the issues we see uh, tend to be clumped around the same 10 or 12 problems. So most customers have the same mistakes. They've, they've committed the same sins, so to speak. And it's usually a two to three week uh, window. And then we can, um, we can resolve most matters in that time frame. Okay. That's a fairly quick fix. And, yeah. and um, I think that, all too often, business people fear um, that they're going to have price shock when they hear what it costs mm -hmm. to do anything, yeah. uh, and we assume <laughs> too high yeah. as opposed to the reality. Typically, what does it cost to, to get these fixes? Yeah. Um, if you're one of those businesses that kind of is clustered in that typical scenario, um, you can, depending on the, the company that you work with uh, to resolve the problems, it could be anywhere from a couple thousand dollars to much more than that, depending on the size of your website. I and mean, if you've got a massive e-commerce site with thousands of products and each and every one of those product pages has an issue, um, it could take some significant time and money to fix. But uh, I would say most of our customers are spending between two and $5,000 soup to nuts to be, uh, resolved and and uh, ready to go. Okay, and then uh, you mentioned an audit. Is that where you start to do sort of a, a cursory complimentary audit? Yeah, that's right. It's sort of like um, we take your car to the mechanic and we say it's it's, it's uh, shifting weird or there's a knocking sound or whatever it might be. The mechanic can kind of guess at what what he thinks is wrong, but he's really going to be able to look under the hood, right? And, and, and take it for a test drive and see what's going on. And um, it's kind of the same thing with a website. We're going to look under the hood. Um, and so we'll do that. We do that for free. Um, we'll take a look, run some initial diagnostics on the site. Um, we've written some programs that allow us to, to sort of 
do a kind of cursory high level view of the state of the code. And that will turn up um, when it is one of the sites that's in that common grouping of problem sites, we can tell that pretty quickly and usually get a pretty accurate quote together pretty quickly because it's, it's a lot of the same problems every time. Okay, great. And so that, that sort of um, one or two page report mm -hmm. is free and yep. um, you're able to, to do that fairly quickly. Yeah, usually um, when, we, when we meet with someone or have a Zoom with them or, or even just exchange email, it's usually a day or two we can get that turned back around to them depending on, depending on demand at that moment, but it's, it's pretty fast. Okay. And my last question is uh, to reach you mm -hmm. um, for a free audit and or a conversation, what's the best way to reach you? Best way to reach us is to go to um, adaptablelab.com. So it's adaptable, lab.com. Uh, right there on the site, you can, you can go on and, and fill out a quick form that indicates your interest in uh, hearing from us. And then we'll take a look at your site and uh, be in touch. Okay, great. So uh, that concludes our segment. Thank you much, very much for uh, joining us. I just want to close by saying uh, anyone out there who feels that their business is way outside the box, please contact us at www.prworkzone.com and we will consider you for a future show. I thank you, Mike, again, and uh, we will talk soon. Thanks, Steve. I'll okay. talk to you, uh, I'm sure, very soon. All right, thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye.